You're listening to Secrets for Scaling, a Gecko Board podcast that explores the growth of secrets of successful founders and CEOs. Whether you're just launching your business or taking your company to the next level, you'll learn proven strategies and tactics for growing a sustainable business. For this episode, we talk to Michael, co-founder and CEO of Happy Socks. Let's start from the beginning. How did you and Victor turn selling socks into a thriving, profitable business? It all started with Victor and I liking socks, and we, we couldn't really find the socks that we wanted on the market. And in Sweden, when you go home to somebody, you take your shoes off when you step into somebody's home. So you would want to wear a nice pair of socks. And in our world, if you had a nice and colorful socks or something, you would call it a happy socks. But you can never find the type of socks that you like. So Victor came up with the idea. Let's start a brand that is named Happy Socks and send design fashionable socks. By coming up with that idea, we created the segment in the sock market called design fashion socks. And that's how we became market leaders and this year sell approximately 40 million pairs of socks uh, eight years later. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but to, to say that, that, it was nothing new really with colorful socks. It was like just defining a segment and giving it a brand, giving it a forgotten item some love. At that point, when Victor came up with this idea in the afternoon, we was basically lying on my kitchen floor and saying, you know, let's do a happy socks. And I went to the computer and I started to Google. I was like, who buys colorful socks and who could do that? And I was like, yeah, pretty much everyone in Europe of a decent income. We have North America. We have Asia. Whoa, guess that we could have a billion people who can buy, buy socks, could be addressable a target group to socks. Because it's not going to be a specific a teenage or a mother or a, a hipster or a fashionista or a business guy. It's pretty much anybody who likes color design instead. And I think as starting a business, you have to believe and think there is, exists a market for what you're going to sell. So you've seen crazy growth. I know at one point you're in 70 countries and 8,000 outlets. We're actually in 90 countries nowadays. And we have 10 to 12,000 retail accounts that sells happy socks. This year, we, we, we think we're going to sell 40 million something pairs of socks, adding underwear to that business, which is soon a considerable volume as well. And then we operate 30 something retail stores globally, and we're vastly opening a retail chain globally under the happy socks flag. So how have you guys been able to achieve such sustainable growth? <laughs> uh, I have no idea. We, if, if the consumer has been buying our product. And by being you know, a desired brand or a product, the retailers are going to buy more of your brand um, if they sell out of it. And, we, and that's how it's, it's just been a healthy growth, organic growth. We haven't even injected any money into our business. That's amazing. So it's just all about a high quality product, huh? High quality product. And I think timing as well is one thing. And, and that our offering, and our offering, our branding is very clear. But to cover the world, we work with a strategy that is distributor strategy. And that is that we find local partners on every market, every country that buys the product from us and then resells it on their market. And that is how we could go global stay financial strong by finding local partners selling us that's great so they help market your product as well they do a lot of the legwork and that they exactly that's what they do we don't actually on any market sell to any retailer ourselves so we have a partner on every market that handles and does the work on the local market in that country you or victor have any experience in e-commerce before launching no how did you how did you learn the ropes along the way? What resources did you use? In 2008, we started Happy Socks when we came up with the idea. The idea was to start an e-com business so that we could hang out in Bali and surf and start a restaurant. That was the real idea behind <laughs> Happy Socks. Uh, so it always started as, let's start an e-com business. And from that, I guess we learned and progressed. Basically learning from experience. Yes. And I have to say why we've been so successful with Happy Socks is that we have recruited 
really strong people. We have had a very relatively young or very young group of people. Is most of your team in Sweden? Do you have any remote employees? So our head office is in Stockholm, Sweden, and we have 75 people in the office. 40% are non-Swedish, um, where we are. The non-Swedish group is from 25 uh, different countries. So we really run an uh, international office in Sweden. The strength and why we have succeeded with, let's say, e uh, is basically because we've hired the best resources uh, in each area. We find young, brilliant people that work with us, and we often give these uh, anyone who starts with us a little bit more responsibility what they prior had. We let them do decisions and take decisions on their own, and we don't blame anybody to, for taking a decision, even if it gets wrong, but we want people to advance. And that has been our key motivators, why people are drive, can drive so fast forward and like working with us. Yeah. So how have you found these people? What have your recruitment strategies look like? <laughs> That's, it's been different over different years now. Now we're working relatively professionally with how we find the right people. Is that we work with the online advertising ourselves. And then we have a certain format. But from the beginning, I would say not focusing on hiring Swedish people. Focusing on hiring you know, expats or foreign people that live in Sweden with a strong knowledge and background. Um, and that are young, I would say, has also been uh, someone who wants to prove something and wants a career. Um, so we've been lucky. And people like our concept. So people, we've been attracting right people as well. So you're in Stockholm now. What happened to the restaurant in Bali? <laughs> no, it's gone. We have, we have an idea to, actually, Victor and I have an idea to buy a hotel somewhere uh, on a Paradise Beach or something and then put up the first sock shop the first Happy Sock sock shop on the beach because it's going to be so so like questionable. Why would you have a sock shop on the <laughs> beach when you're when you're not going to wear any socks on the beach? So we sort of have that idea still, but we left it. Amazing. <laughs> what are there any secrets to? It seems like you two have a very successful partnership and like obviously work well together. Seem to like working well. Any yep. secrets to make that work? I would say the secrets behind our business is that we've been very well structured since day one. We've been very, we've always worked with the professional board uh, of the company, board of directors, um, so that, you know, when you work on a daily basis, you meet in a board meeting, you would, you know, want to look up and look at the horizon and discuss the future as well. So it's like having a good structure, good agreements, um, simplifies being partners and avoiding any discussions or misunderstandings is being very clear from the beginning so in mine and victor's uh, case it's like victor pretty much focuses on the design the, the the creative part of the business while i very much focus on running the business and being profitable and the sales and all that so we very much have our own part of the business and during these eight years we've only had one uh, thing that we didn't agree on so our partnership is very successful and that's i think is a must to succeed with business i think there's too many people who's worked in companies where the companies run out of a private perspective for us it's very important that the company is run from a business perspective um, that nobody should be involved in you know private matters or any you know it should be clear you run it as a very much corporate and if, if you have it well structured, you can be very creative as well. When measuring success, what, what metrics are most important to the health of the business today? I would say that people are happy. <laughs> that, that if you're going to sell a happy pro a product, that I, what we're doing, we're selling an emotion. We're selling, when you put on your socks in the morning, you need to give yourself a smile or the consumer a smile. They like what they put on. That is essential in what we're doing. The people around us, everybody who works with Happy Socks, they need to be surprised. They need to be happy with it. If we lose that feeling, then we're not going to continue having the great success that we have. So first off, is everybody happy that works around us with us um, on the global market? Are we doing the consumer happy? So how do you measure that happiness? In the office, it's very easy because we do qualitative and quantified uh, what do you say, um, surveys in the company. Um, external, you work with uh, your distributors and you know if they are happy, if they're you know positive to us as a company, they're going to do a good job. 
And same goes with the retailers that sell our product. If we can give them a better point of sales display or give them a better offering or campaign or material, they're going to be happier to expose our product out in the retail. For sure. So are those metrics much different than they were in 2008? I would say they're not very much different, but they are uh, defined and they are uh, followed up today. So as uh, CEO of the business, I need to be very with this. I need to listen to the noise that goes around and make sure that I pick up whenever something is wrong. And if something's wrong, I bring it up directly. This has been a little bit strange because, as I said, we have people from 25 different countries in our office. They're not used to this way of being in a company and the openness and so on. And in every company, you're going to have at times, and especially when growing so hysterically fast, you're going to get people a little bit stressed out. They're going to be anxious and they're not really knowing what goes on because there's so many changes in an, in an office that is doubling in size every year. So, you know, if I suddenly hear that oh, people are complaining about something, I would ask uh, the CEO of the company, gather everybody and say, you know what, I've heard about this. Um, break up just in the middle of the day and I say, now you have two hours and you sit in groups of five to ten and you write down what the hell is wrong with the company. What do we need to improve? And then they get two hours to do that and then I collect all that uh, and we summarize it and put it together and then we email it out to everybody and says, this is what is concluded that people are not happy with it in the business. And then we put a small action team to it and that needs to adapt to these changes and make the changes that are necessary. That's amazing that you not only gather that feedback, but you actually create action around it. I think yes. that's something that a lot of startups you know, miss, that they struggle with, you know? No, that, and that is, that is a normal, and that's what I say is also from my heart, it's nice to do change and keep people happy, but if you don't have a board that you can bounce your ideas and help you have a wider horizon and say, this is what you need to do, a good board, they will actually advise you to do this. So it's a combination yeah. of getting all your structure in order, in order for keeping people happy. Because that is the problem with any startup. Any problem with the startups, these entrepreneurial companies, is that you know, if they're su successful, they grow so fast and they change so fast that you can lose people in the, in the growth. And you don't want to lose good people in the growth. Would you say that being a creative company and hiring creative people has helped you grow? Absolutely. Because that gives us new ways of thinking. Right. And anybody really seems to make the brand stand out. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and once again, I fall back. You can be creative and do a super nice design on the sock and do something new. That's creative. But in any growing company, you need to finance the business um, or get the bank on your side or anything. And a creative CFO is going to get the bank on your side and present it in a new creative way for them you know, the problem that you have that is going to be able to solve your problems with finance, financing the business. So it's like, there's so many ways of being creative. So shifting gears a little bit, um, but yet still related, maintaining a healthy work-life balance for employees and fast growing companies seems to be a challenge. How, have, how has Happy Socks tackled this? We have not had an unhealthy, um, unhealthy, I ran an advertising agency previously uh, where I ran a, nine years of unhealthy um, startup, startup, I don't know what you say, working environment where people work too much and they, you know, get tired, burned out and everything. So it's been very important for me with this company not to uh, move into, uh, to ensure that we have a healthy lifestyle, that people are healthy. Right. So how do, you, think, and, how do you do that? And I think how I think, I think the, uh, how we could avoid it is basically that we've been hiring in time We've had enough resources to grow um, because that is most usually the problem is that you grow very fast and you're not fast enough on hiring the people. So even, mm -hmm. from, day, even from day one, when you know, we saw we were grow growing and we said, you know what, we don't really have the money to hire it, but, or it's not safe to hire yet, we took the decision to hire. Because this is the reason you don't hire. You want to make sure, okay, it's good. It's that we have the finances to hire a person three months later instead of doing it now when you actually need it and when you start burning people out by giving them more work. It's also a risk <laughs> with hiring. You know, it's, it's easy to say that is how we succeeded, but what if we would have had a turn in trend and we would not have 
sold as many socks we did, then I would be sitting with too much staff instead and the profitability would not be there and I wouldn't have the ability to grow and so on. So oh, it's a combination. For us, it worked this time. But it's not a key for yeah. every business. But that's how I kept this business healthy and the people healthy is that I've hired enough people. Would you say that a big part of being CEO is all about taking those kind of calculated risks? Absolutely. I, to, to be CEO, it's about taking risks and daring to do things. For us, it's very different because it's like, you know, I compare, it, I compare my business to all these online businesses and everything. But you have to think about when I say that we're going to sell 40 million pairs of socks, you know, it's actually, you, you need to buy the yarn somewhere. You need to create the thread that goes into socks. You need to mix it with Elastan. You need to color it. Or you need to go to a warehouse. It needs EIN code. The infrastructure of creating a product on a global basis is crazy if you compare it to a digital startup. And I was like, I sometimes so much admire, I wish I was in another business. <laughs> That's a great point. There is a lot of overhead there creating an actual physical product. Yeah. It's kind of yeah, amazing you guys do it with 75 people. Yeah, but then we have all these local distributors on every market that actually sells the product and so on. So, you know, if you look on the token people work with working with Happy Socks, you would probably equal 500 people or something, 400. Right. So how do you find those partners, those distributors? Uh, for us to find these partners, we've tried many uh, ways and I, I am very quick to adapt. So sometimes I try to find it established company on the market that already sold socks on that market or they could sell underwear and set work with us but where we've been most successful is finding young entrepreneurs who wants to start a distribution company they want to get into this business it's probably happy socks would have been their first or second brand that they sign on to distribute on the market so working with people that have a good that we believe in has been the success for us rather than finding the proper partner that works on paper and looks good that's amazing so supportive of the entrepreneurial ecosystem that's great yes absolutely and that's it that's very much the ecosystem we have created with happy socks is finding these entrepreneurials same as us on the markets wanting to build and today these guys that started with us six seven years ago as distributors they hold five to 10 successful brands on the market now that they distribute. So they started with Happy Socks, they grew it, they became profitable, and then they started adding more brands. How much of your business is e-commerce for brick and mortar today? Today, I would say we're about, e-com business is about 35% of our turnover, 30, 35% of our turnover which is very high. Uh, it took six years uh, for us to build. We were very successful with building the, you know, the wholesale side of the business and the retail side. It took six years for us to become very successful on the e-com side, though, to become profitable there. So it's not as easy as uh, one thought when we discussed to <laughs> live on the hotel and run an e-com page. Um, yeah. It was the opposite. So what changed? What happened after six years that helped you see that success in e-commerce? Uh, I would say we uh, certain size scalability. You become big. We started having local warehouses on multiple markets. Uh, we had an international team in the office that, you know, somebody speaking China, Chinese, somebody speaking Japanese, somebody speaking Spanish, you know, who could handle these local adaptions of the page. Um, warehouses on the different markets. Um, so uh, recruiting some people from Facebook, recruiting people from all these Google to be able to advertise and calculate and to get the, getting the stars right takes time. And it's much more complicated to get stars right in e-com than in retail and wholesale, is my opinion. So if you were to go back to 2008 and give yourself some advice about on the e-commerce side of things, what would you, what would you say? Don't think it's easy. <laughs> that was my biggest mistake. <laughs> no, it's like, it's so stupid. I would say it's like, okay, if you, open, if you get a great location on the store, you can step outside and count how many people pass the store. It's easy. You know, yeah. you stand outside the store and, okay, I have a thousand people passing the store. But if you, if you go, if, if you go 
if you open a page online, everybody thinks, oh, I'm reaching millions of people. But in fact, not one person is going to pass by your e-com store. You know what I mean? You think that, you know, that organic traffic is going to be bigger than what it is, I would say. I had an over, over belief in organic traffic. And was it a matter of just eventually getting there? Or did you guys put some paid into it? Uh, we, we have a great organic traffic today, but we buy traffic as well. And we work with brand advertising. You know, you need to, once again, you need to get the stars right is what I say and get your recipe, what is successful, how you get traffic to your page. That took time. Any other words of advice for fellow founders beyond just e-commerce? Uh, my, my advice to everybody is that, yeah, it's, it's very simple that you need to believe in your idea, whatever somebody says, because you're always going to doubt yourself and start doubting when people give you critics or say something different. So you have to believe in it. And how can you strongly believe in it? You need to count on it. So do, a, you know, a healthy calculation on the business you're planning to make sure that you can grow and you can be healthy and profitable. So believe and make sure that you count it correct then work with a professional board that you appoint a board of directors to help you steer the company and have everything organized structure agreements and so everything is clean no mess you need to be organized because when fire takes off you want you know you want to know what you got around you so structure and organization is what i think is essential to when you start up a business Amazing. Sounds like that's really where the having a co-founder comes in handy too, to have that, that yin and that yang. Exactly. The, the exactly. Structure part. exactly. Yeah. No, I agree. So those are my tips to anybody starting up and just, you know, I think also the last one is devotion. You need to devote everything to your business. Um, and I, uh, you know, you need to be prepared to put all your time and energy into it. And I, I'd rather believe somebody, you know, I don't believe, I, I believe somebody who starts a business and they resign and they say, I'm going to work with this full time, even I don't know if I'm going to get any money. I think the chances that they're going to succeed are bigger than people staying in an employment and, you know, working 10% with their idea or their concept, because I think they will eventually lose interest or it's not going to take their hundred. They, you need to devote your time to something. I think then you're going to have a bigger chance of succeeding. The more you put at stake, the more you risk, the more devotion you give to it, the more likely it's going to succeed. Thank you for listening to Gecko Board's Secrets for Scaling podcast. Hope to catch you next time.